to the tribunal, specifically to our chairman, Yu Tianlong, who, as you all know, is the Secretary General of CTAC. I want to start off by uh, introducing myself and then I'll ask my co arbiters to introduce themselves. And then I'd like the parties, the representatives, to introduce themselves, state their names, and who we represent. And then we'll move on as to how we're going to proceed with Jerry. As Jerry just mentioned, that my name is Yu Jianwu, I'm Vice Chairman and Secretary General of China's National Economic and Trade. Arbitration Commission is also known as CTAG. And then I'd like to ask my co arbitrator to introduce themselves. Age go, uh, uh, beauty goes first, so. <laughs> That's very kind of you, uh, Aunt Sally Harpool. I uh, reside in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Special Administration re region of uh, China. Uh, I am on the CTAG Commission, which is a great honor. Uh, have served as chairman of the IBA Arbitration Committee and uh, feel very privileged to be here today. Thank you. Hi. My name is Kai Hober, uh, partner in my name is Walking Stockholm, Sweden, and professor at the Oblo and Uppsala University, Sweden. So I'd like you to state your name and who you represent Clayton. Hello. Clayton, the side. Okay, Clayton, goes first. Good afternoon, honorable members of the tribunal. My name is Jennifer Sia, and I'm representing the claimant Mediterranean Community Conference Services. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sri Han Kui, and together with my co counsel we uh, represent Mediterranean Community Conference Services. <laughs> okay. My name is Jadish Menezes, and I'm from Nansa Hyderabad, and today we are we representing Equatorial Control System. Good afternoon, Arbitral Tribunal. My name is Ishita Bhardwaj, and I represent Equatoriana Control Systems. Well, these are all very difficult names to remember. But anyway, I'd like to extend my warm congratulations to all of you for having survived the last stage. So, <coughs> anyway, we're going to have number one, but you know, uh, all of you have been so excellent this year. It's not been easy for any one of you. Well, I wonder if you have had some discussion about how we're going to uh, proceed with the jury and how would you like to do that? Yes, Mr. Chairman, the parties have come to an agreement. The respondent will start with the procedural aspects and will address it for 13 minutes. 13 two minutes? minutes? Okay. Two, with two minutes of rebuttal. Okay. I will be responding to that with 14 minutes of mission and one minute of rebuttal. And then we will move on to the claiming merits. And uh, similarly, with 14 minutes and one minute rebuttal, and then the respondent will reply with 15 minutes and one minute rebuttal. Well, this is very good. Uh, Any 14 minutes. Submissions? No? Well, that's exactly what we're going to handle with. And, uh, well, anyway, we're going to proceed on a fair basis and to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, the case is heard and the salary is going to give time. So, we start with the respondent. Mr. Presiding Arbitrator, Mr. Presiding Arbitrator, Honorable Members, good afternoon. My name is Jagdish Menezes, together with my colleague, Ishita Bhadwaj, we represent the respondent, Equatoriana Control Systems. This dispute surrounds the supply and installation of the master control system by my client aboard the MS Vis, a yacht owned by claimant. Now for the next 13 minutes, I shall address two jurisdictional issues that arise in this case concerning, first, the participation of Dr. Mercado on claimant's legal team and second, the inadmissibility of the claims associated with the lease contract entered into by claimant 
due to the bribery in securing it. If I may, I will proceed with my first submission. We submit that the tribunal should terminate Dr. Mercado's participation on claimant's legal team. And to prove this, I will show two things. First, that the tribunal has an inherent power to regulate a counsel's participation. And second, that the circumstances of this case warrant the exercise of such power to remove Dr. Mercado. Turning to the first limb, we do agree that there is no express provision in the CTAC rules or in the Ancitral model law to regulate a counsel's participation. However, we submit that the tribunal has an inherent power to do so. Now, in considering an inherent power, we submit there are two basic considerations. First, the intent of the parties in creating this tribunal to resolve their dispute. And second, the necessity of the exercise of the power by the tribunal to ensure that it can fulfill its functions. So you're not relying on any particular provisions of the CTAC rules? Uh, I am, Mr. Arbitrator. In fact, the next point I wish to make was that under Article 22 of the CTAC rules and Article 18 of the ANSITRA Model Law, these require that the tribunal decide the dispute having remained independent of the parties and having treated them equally. Now it is our submission that a council, a council's participation may interfere with the adjudication of the dispute by creating conflicts of interest with the arbitrator and to that extent impede the tribunal in fulfilling its functions. Now this is particularly so in a case like this where the council has been introduced by a party after the tribunal has been formed. A brief reference to the record here. The parties had, by 3rd of August 2011, agreed to appoint Professor Presiding Arbitrator to chair this panel. And on 30th August of 2011, that was notified uh, by the CTEC Secretariat. Now, it was on that very day that the claimant informed my client of Dr. Mercado's participation. And at this point, I must add significantly, failed to disclose any of the relevant and substantial relationships between Dr. Mercado and Professor Arbitrator. Now, that obligation on them comes from Article 9 of the CTEC rules, which requires that parties proceed with the arbitration in bona fide cooperation. Uh, there is also an obligation on the party to disclose by virtue of the widely accepted IBA guidelines on conflict of interest, General Standard 7. So you're implying to say, you know, the addition of Dr. Mercado to the legal team of the claimants is ill-tension? Mr. Arbitrator, I, I do not use the term ill-intention. I would rather use the term misstyled. And by way of example, I would like to cite a few cases where the tribunals have interfered with counsel's appointment. I begin with the noted <coughs> decision of an exit tribunal in Trivatska versus Republic of Slovenia, where the tribunal, in a similar fact situation, restricted a counsel from participating in the proceedings. Tribunals have also exercised inherent powers over counsels in other cases. I may cite ICC case 10776 of 2000, where again a counsel was restrained from participating in the proceedings because he was also to be called in as a witness to the proceedings. Now, what these but that's ICC arbitration, and uh, this is CTEC arbitration. Can we use that as an example? Is that appropriate? And also, you mentioned the investment arbitration. You know, there is a distinction between investment arbitration and commercial arbitration. There's some quite large differences. Do you think the example, like the case instance you have cited, is appropriate in this arbitration? I understand your concern, Professor Arbitrator. I do believe these are appropriate illustrations of my point. The principle, again, for clarification that we rely on, is the inherent power of the tribunal. A power that exists in every tribunal by virtue of its existence. Now, how do we justify that power? We justify that power by a statutory reference. We look at Article 22 of the CTI rules and Article 18, from where we source the function of the tribunal to decide a dispute having remained independent of the parties and having treated them equally. 
Now that being the function of the tribunal, this mistyled appointment of counsel by the claimant would interfere with that function and hence the tribunal must step in to prevent abusive process. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Uh, Menezes, the um, Article 22 of the CTAC rules refers to the independence of the arbitrator. Um, as I take it, you're talking about Dr. Mercado in this particular argument. Uh, could you elaborate uh, as to how we would apply um, your proposal to uh, the situation of counsel? Certainly, certainly, Madam Arbitrator. In fact, this draws me into the next limb of my submission. What are the circumstances that warrant the exercise of the power? Now, to address Madam Arbitrator's concern, I would submit that the test for whether the counsel must be removed is actually a test of whether her participation influences the independence and impartiality of the arbitrator in question. So the test is actually, it's actually two sides of the same coin, if I may draw that as an appropriate metaphor. But is the remedy then to challenge the arbitrator rather than to remove the counsel? Mr. Arbitrator, I would submit that that is one of the remedies. I do propose this as another remedy and I do urge the tribunal to consider that since the tribunal was formed and proceedings were about to begin, it is in the interest of both time and prevention of further costs to the parties and also bearing in mind that the parties mutually agreed to appoint Professor Arbitrator given his vast experience in this field. It is in the best interest considering that our remedy is that if the council is restricted, the whole problem will be resolved and the arbitration can continue. It is in the best interest that our that this particular remedy be upheld. But are you going to more challenging the presiding arbitrator now in this arbitration or not? No, Mr. Arbitrator, we are not challenging the Professor Presiding Arbitrator in this arbitration. In our statement of defense, we have merely reserved the right to do so in the event that our arguments as regards counsel's restriction is not upheld. Well, it's very kind of you not to uh, challenge me. <laughs> I'd like to ask you a question. That is, a party has the fundamental right to choose his counsel. And on that, in accordance with that principle, if, you know, in a way, if the tribunal has the power to remove Dr. McConnell from the legal team of the claimant, would it raise a concern that the arbitral award that we're going to render would be facing the risk of being set aside by the other side? Mr. Arbitrator, I note that there are two parts to your question. I shall address both. As regards the party's right of legal representation of choice, yes, we do admit that that right does exist. But that is not an unrestricted right, particularly after a tribunal has begun to function. May I draw another example? Let's say that their party wished to hire a particular counsel and could not afford that counsel. Is the tribunal to wait until that they until they may uh, draw the necessary resources to do so? Alternatively, if a, if a counsel that they were to appoint had to misbehave before the tribunal, can they plead their right of legal representation that he must continue to plead? Now that is a perfect illustration to show that the party's right of legal representation is not an unrestricted right more so after a tribunal has begun to function. And then, addressing the second part of your question, as regards enforcement, our equal right to be heard by an independent and impartial tribunal, which would also make the award susceptible under the same provision of the New York Convention, I refer to Article 5, 1b, this would be equally impeded if the tribunal hearing the heat matter was to have conflicts of interest within a parent council. So therefore, the question of enforcement applies equally to both parties, but when the two rights are measured in balance, we note that their right is a restricted one. Our right is not. It is a fundamental one. Excuse me, Mr. Menezes. It sounds like the bottom line is that you're questioning whether the tribunal will be independent with Dr. Ricardo's involvement. Uh, could you elaborate on how uh, you would support such a suggestion? Certainly, Madam Arbitrator. We have cited several circumstances. Before I proceed to address these circumstances, I would place three basic considerations before the tribunal. First, that under Article 30 of the CTAC rules, 
the standard is one of justifiable doubt as to the arbitrator's independence and impartiality. Second, that the significance would lie in the length and breadth of the relationship. Uh, in other words, the devil would lie in detail here. And finally, I would quote from the US Supreme Court decision in Commonwealth Courtings when they said, even sporadic but substantial relationships are enough. Now with these three considerations in mind, I proceed to the circumstances. There is a regular interaction between Dr. Mercado and Professor Arbitrator as they both teach at the same university. They deliver lectures together, in fact, to the ITL faculty. Now she is also the godmother to Professor Arbitrator's youngest child, which while we do accept under the very IBA guidelines I quoted, <laughs> does not fall strictly under the definition of close family member, we do submit it is an equally compelling relationship because the test is one of close family relationship and a godmother by virtue of her functions in protecting the child in the event of untimely demise or also by virtue of her role in the upbringing of a child is an equally compelling circumstance. Madam Arbitrator, I have some concerns. Are, are you suggesting that in all cases where there are two faculty members on the same faculty that you would have this issue? Uh, or do you, is there something particular about this case that uh, would guide us to such a conclusion? Madam Arbitrator, I would say that in this case particularly, the nature of the work done by Professor Arbitrator and Dr. Mercado bears relevance. Now, they do regularly interact due to their professional commitments. They do deliver lectures together to the ITL faculty. In fact, I may quote a decision of the Hungarian Supreme Court, BVM Appellant versus Global Center, where two arbitrators and the council uh, were all teaching together in the same uh, university and in the same department. And it was held that that was sufficient to cause justifiable doubt. At this point, I would like to clarify that Questions of conflict of interest do not merely relate to what happens in the proceedings, but they touch upon issues of confidentiality of proceedings, they touch upon issues of unfair procedural advantage that that party may derive because the counsel that they appoint regularly interacts and hence may know what maybe Professor Arbitrator likes to hear in arguments. Therefore, when we look at the conflict of interest issue, we must consider all these and determine justifiable doubt. So my uh, question, in what manner can we remove Dr. Mercado from the legal team? Uh, may I ask them that question? How can we remove Dr. Mercado from the legal team of claimants? What a manner. Uh, I, I, would, I would say that that may be done by a procedural award on the issue. And procedural award? It is a preliminary. One is to issue an, a procedural order to uh, ask Dr. Mercado to step down as counsel. Indeed, Mr. Arbitrator, I would say that you are seeking. Indeed, Mr. Arbitrator, a preliminary award on the issue of her representation uh, before the children. Well, assuming the tribunal does not have the power to remove Dr. McCullough from the legal team, will you continue to challenge me? Uh, Mr. Arbitrator, as we have reserved our right, I would take it back to my client to make that decision. But what is of immediate relevance is that we have reserved our right. Uh, Mr. Arbitrator, I have entered the last two minutes of my reserve time. May I now move to the issue of admissibility? Uh, okay, you can give me two minutes. I have one or two questions more on this issue. Now, let us assume that we agree with you that we do have the authority to remove Dr. Mercado um, and that we do that in a form of procedural order. How would that order be enforced, in your view? Or how should it be enforced? Well, Mr. Arbitrator, I do believe that both the parties have agreed to arbitrate in good faith in pursuance to Article 9 of the CTAC rules. We would expect that the claimant, since it is seeking relief from the tribunal and not my client, uh, would, I, I do believe, uh, adhere to whatever award the tribunal passes at the first preliminary stages. And what do we do if Dr. Mercado appears anyway? Well, Mr. Arbitrator, my answer to that question would be that that would simply be further evidence of, may I now borrow the term, ill intention on the part of claimant. And since claimant seeks relief from this tribunal and not my client, I do believe that claimant would be well advised to adhere to whatever preliminary awards this tribunal would pass. 
I turn now to the question of admissibility very briefly since I am running out of time. The, our submission is that the claims associated with the unlawful lease contract are inadmissible. And to prove this, I will show two things. First, that claimant secured the lease contract unlawfully. And second, that claims that are associated with an unlawful contract are inadmissible. And what do you mean by an unlawful contract? Uh, Mr. Arbitrator, in this case, there is clear evidence that the lease contract which they entered into for the MS Pacifica staff was entered into after a bribe was paid by their broker to the assistant of the yacht owner. Now, in such a situation, that entire contract becomes tainted by that corruption. As I will show that those claims are inadmissible uh, before the judge. And, and we have jurisdiction to deal with issues of bribery in your view that would not violate international public policy, for example? Mr. Arbitrator, there are two parts of your question. I will submit that the payment does violate international public policy, but before that, to address your concern, we do not contest the tribunal's jurisdiction to hear this matter. In fact, we do admit it is a settled position that tribunals are well within their jurisdiction to consider issues of bribery. But we do contest the admissibility of these claims. The distinction being that jurisdiction deals with the existence and the scope of a power of the tribunal. Admissibility looks to the fact that though that power exists, whether it should be applied as regards a particular dispute. Now, it's an unlawful contract. Are you inclined to say that the claimant knew about the uh, bribery? Mr. Arbitrator, the second limb of my contention, I will show that the broker had the implied authority. Do you have the evidence? I will, I will. Shall I move straight to that point? Shall I conclude on international public policy first? Okay. Uh, Mr. Arbitrator, briefly to conclude on international public policy, my submission is that while initially only bribery of public officials, that condemnation was looked at as a rule of international public policy, the opinion has shifted to include bribery among private officials as well. Now this is seen from a bunch of new legislations, notably most recently in the United Kingdom, China, Switzerland, Austria, Russia among others. Uh, in fact, even in the United States, the courts have been begun to apply the Travel Act to prohibit payments among private persons in the nature of a bribe. United Nations Convention Against Corruption, the European Union Council Framework Decision, this all shows that the issue of condemnation of bribery among private officials has risen to the standard of international public policy, making this payment unlawful in any jurisdiction. Addressing the second concern of <coughs> Professor Presiding Arbitrator, it is our submission that an agent is liable, I, I mean a principal is liable for all the acts of his agent done in the course of his employment. Now in this case, the chronology of events is of interest because the broker located the yacht and came back to the claimant and told the claimant that the yacht was available. Thereafter, claimant promised a success fee of 50,000 US dollars if the contract was secured. Now such a high success fee itself raises a red flag, as it is commonly known, of the propensity of the broker to pay a bribe. But uh, claimant on its part, I, I do understand to uh, stop here. I'm sorry for that. I'd like the uh, claimant to uh, give your submissions. Good afternoon, Professor Yu, Professor Harbaugh, and Professor Hobart. My name is Jennifer Xia, and together with my co-counsel, Mr. Sviha Kui, I represent the Claimant Mediterranean Elite Conference Services. Now, it is essential that this tribunal bear no illusions. The respondent is clearly in breach of its contract and is seeking to raise these unnecessary procedural challenges to further stall these proceedings. I will be responding to the two key submissions made by counsel for the respondent in the same order. However, I will demonstrate to this tribunal that firstly, Dr. Mercado should not be removed from the claimant's legal team. Secondly, this tribunal should not preclude the claimant from recovering its rightful damages. Turning to my first submission regarding the challenge of Dr. Mikado, I will first demonstrate that this tribunal lacks the power to consider such a challenge. 
Secondly, I will demonstrate that there are simply no reasons for this tribunal to remove her in any case. Members of the tribunal, the respondent has conceded that there are no express provisions within the CTAC rules or Danubian law providing a mechanism for removing counsel. And if the respondent had any genuine concerns about the impartiality of this tribunal, it should have raised a challenge to Professor Yu under Article 30, Subsection 3 of the CTEC rules. Well, Dr. Ricardo was added to the legal team of claimants after the formation of the arbitral tribunal. Well, when you appointed Dr. Mercado, were you aware of the relationship between myself and her? Professor Yu, first to clarify, Dr. Mercado was appointed on the same day as the constitution of the tribunal. There is no evidence to suggest that she was appointed after the claimant was informed of the constitution. Secondly, the claimant was aware of the circumstances. However, we do not consider that there are any objectionable relationships between Dr. Mercado and Professor Yu, and therefore we have no duty to disclose anything. Party's decision to uh, select Mr. Yu as presiding arbitrator took place prior to the day of the Constitution of the Tribunal. I mean, how, how do you resolve this timing aspect in terms of what you've just said? Certainly, Professor Harbour. The important thing to note is that uh, the length of an arbitration is immensely long. It can last up to two years, and parties, having the right to choose its counsel, should be free to change the composition of its legal team as the proceedings change. And furthermore, the claimants in this case have not in any way acted in bad faith, contrary to what counsel for the respondent has submitted. We have appointed Dr. Mercado simply because of her expertise and not in any way because of her relationship with Professor Yu. Do you recognize that as such transitions take place within a team that that may change the overall environment of the arbitration in terms of counsel and the tribunal, that there are possibilities that changes could take place? Indeed, in certain circumstances, um, perhaps a party, if it acts in bad faith and appoints a counsel where it clearly knows that the counsel has an IBA red list relationship with the arbitrator, then this tribunal should find that it has some form of limited power to sanction the party, perhaps in terms of, of costs. However, this is not a case where the claimant has in any way acted in bad faith. How can we assess that? Um, I will first address the relationship between Dr. Mercado and Professor Yu. None of the circumstances relied on by the respondent in this case fall within any of the 41 IBA red or orange list circumstances. And clearly, this is indicative that the relationship does not give rise to justifiable doubts. Indeed, they are professors at the same university. However, this relationship can be considered membership in the same professional association. And under the IBA guidelines, this is considered a green list circumstance. It does not objectively give rise to justifiable doubts. Does, do the IBA guidelines deal with issues of whether counsel should continue on the case? The IBA guidelines address um, removal of arbitrators. However, since it is the respondent's contention that the addition of Dr. Mercado to the, claim, uh, to the claimant's legal team creates justifiable doubts, I'm using the IBA guidelines to suggest that this is in fact not the case. Now furthermore, indeed, Dr. Mercado is the godmother to Professor Hu's children, uh, his youngest child. However, the status of a godmother varies from culture to culture and family to family. And this tribunal cannot infer from this mere formality that this, her status, in fact, gives rise to a significant personal relationship with Professor Yu. It is important. Let me ask you a question. Uh, you just cited the IBA guideline. Of course, there are guidelines. And uh, well, what do you have to do to have a personal or a close relationship? Uh, Dr. McCardell is my youngest, uh, youngest child's godmother. We're on first name terms, you know, work together from time to time in the same faculty. Well, don't you think 
at least an appearance would create some, you know, justifiable doubts or to, for my impartiality. Professor Yu, the circumstances listed on the IBA red list are circumstances which may be considered to give rise to a presumption that there is a significant relationship that will give rise to justifiable doubts. But for relationships not listed on the IBA guidelines, it is suggested that this tribunal consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. And it is important for us now to turn to the record. If I may direct this tribunal to page 39 of the record, In paragraph 20, second line, it states that Dr. Mikado delivers lectures to the ITL faculty as part of Professor Presiding Arbitrator's course, and as a consequence, they have occasional work-related contact. In the next paragraph, it also states that Dr. Mikado has occasional coffee with Professor Presiding Arbitrator's wife. Now, the respondent has been able to find such detail about Dr. Mikado and Professor Presiding Arbitrator's family's intimate personal detail, but it has not been able to find any evidence of any relationship between Dr. Mikado and Professor Presiding Arbitrator outside of work. There is simply no personal contact, and therefore, it is not, um, this tribunal should not infer from the mere status and title of Godmother that this in fact gives rise to a significant personal relationship. May, may I ask you, if, if we're going down the path of looking at this in terms of justifiable doubts, um, perhaps in the mind of a reasonable person, is this an issue of the reality, the actual facts, or is it an issue of perception? It is important, indeed, justifiable doubts means how it is being perceived by a reasonable and informed third party. However, this is viewed from a reasonable and informed third party that has knowledge about the actual circumstances, and the reasonable and informed third party would not consider that a relationship that does not have any actual personal contact to give rise to justifiable doubts, despite the title. Now, members of the tribunal, I would like to go back to my first um, submission regarding the fact that this tribunal in fact lacks the power to consider such a challenge. Now, counsel for the respondent has sought to rely on the Havatka and Slovenia case to demonstrate that this tribunal has some form of inherent power to remove a party's counsel. However, the Havatka uh, case cannot be relied on by this tribunal for two very important reasons. Firstly, in Rompetra and Romania, the next exit case in which a challenge to, uh, to counsel was considered, the tribunal expressly refrained from confirming the Havatska position. This shows that even within exit jurisprudence, there is much controversy as to whether such a power indeed exists. Furthermore, as noted by Professor Yu, there are fundamental differences between exit arbitration and CTEC arbitration. For example, one very important example is that where a challenge to arbitrator is brought, a C um, an exit tribunal can decide on this challenge itself. On the contrary, in CTEC arbitration, the challenge has to be launched to the chairman of the CTEC. This demonstrates that this tribunal has a more limited and, um, scope of inherent power. Now, even if this tribunal considers that about the ICC case that was mentioned by the other side, does that change your view or change your argument? The ICC case um, was where the party wanted to appoint the counsel as witness as well. That is clear evidence of bad faith. And um, the claimant concedes that where there is clear evidence of bad faith, this tribunal has some form of power to sanction the party, as the parties indeed do have a duty to comply with its obligation of good faith. However, this is simply not the case. So we can forget about all these cases that have been cited by the other side? Sorry, could you... So we can forget about all the cases referred to by the other side? Members of the tribunal, indeed. The cornerstone of international commercial arbitration is party autonomy. And since the parties in this case have agreed to Article 20 of the CTEC rules, permitting parties to appoint counsel of its own choice, and they have also agreed to Article 30, which 
states that the express remedy for a conflict of interest is to challenge the arbitrator. This should be respected by this tribunal. If Dr. McCuddle is not removed from the legal team, then I think the you know, respondent is going to uh, have reserved the right to challenge me. Uh, do you still want <laughs> Dr. McCuddle on team? Professor Yu, first of all, um, if I may direct this tribunal to Article 30 of the CTEC rules. It states that a party may challenge an arbitrator within 15 days. The keyword is challenge, not reserve its right to challenge. And the respondent has failed to comply with this and has waived its right. It therefore cannot ask this tribunal to now invent some form of power to resolve the very same conflict. And therefore, it has also been affirmed by the ASM shipping case that the respondent cannot later challenge the award because it has essentially agreed to permit Professor Presiding Arbitrator to permit, uh, continue in this arbitration. Now, in the interest of time, I shall now move on to my second submission regarding the allegations of bribery. I will first demonstrate that um, introduction fees are not contrary to public policy and there is no risk of the award being set aside. Secondly, the claimant always acted in good faith and had no knowledge of the bribe. It simply cannot be held liable for actions of its broker in which it did not endorse. Members of the tribunal, the important contract to consider here is the contract between the claimant and the respondent, which is valid and enforceable under the laws of Mediterraneo. And clearly, the laws of Mediterraneo do not consider introduction fees contrary to their international public policy, and the respondent can, has failed to show any evidence why um, introduction fees are con considered contrary to public policy. Yes, yeah, I, I find it a bit puzzling, and perhaps you can help me. Um, as we understand it, the brokerage fee that was paid on the lease was at a standard rate. Um, and then another fee uh, was also paid, uh, not of insubstantial amount. Uh, how can we as a tribunal uh, understand uh, what was going on in the minds of the parties? Uh, basic questions which one might ask oneself with this ad additional amount that was paid. Professor Harpo, the claimant paid the 15% commission initially because it considered that there will be a large number of yards available on the market and it would be easy for the broker to charter a substitute yacht. However, when the broker came back to the claimant to inform it of the difficulties it was facing, the claimant had to offer it a higher price to engage in negotiations with Mr. Goldridge, which is the only owner of the yacht that was available for lease. Further, a higher brokerage fee. Yes. A higher um, success fee in this case. And furthermore, this tribunal cannot infer from the mere fact that the claimant paid a higher success fee to the broker that it in fact authorized this bribe. It has been affirmed by the ICC case 4145 and 9333 that a high success fee alone is not indicative of authorization of a bribe. The Westinghouse case also suggests that it, the burden of proof is on the respondent to prove to an extremely high standard that there are in fact um, there is in fact authorization of the bribe, as bribery is a very serious allegation. Therefore, members of the tribe, what, what impact, um, if any, should um, the finding of the court specifically have uh, in, in, in how we look at that amount of money? and how it should be characterized. Members of the tribunal, as I have um, mentioned earlier, the laws of Pacifica are not applicable here, as all the claimant is asking is for this tribunal to enforce the valid contract under the laws of Mediterraneo and permit the claimant to recover damages that it incurred due to the respondent's breach. Even if the respondent somehow argues that Pacifica law is applicable as a mandatory rule, I have also demonstrated that the claimant had no knowledge of the bribe and did not authorize the bribe and 
Therefore, the claimant should not be subjected to the severe sanction of being denied its rightful damages. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Well, one, one more question before we move on on that. Let's assume <clears throat> the tribunal were to find that there is bribery involved here. How would that affect your claims in this case? In the, um, if the tribunal did find that there were uh, that bribery is proven, then the award may be contrary to public policy. However, the claimant will then dispute that only parts of the contract that are tainted by bribery and not the entire sum of damages. Thank you. Just two quick points of rebuttal. First, uh, I would clarify that my perhaps my opponent misunderstood. We did not rely on Rabatska, we merely provided Rabatska as an example alongside other cases, an ICC decision, I may point out Canon partners from the US. The, the basis of our submission to which they have not responded is we source the obligation of the tribunal from an inherent power. Now inherent powers, by virtue of the very meaning of the word inherent, exist independent of any statutory references. Because if we were to read them from statutory references, then we would not be considering an inherent power but we would be merely widely reading an express power. Therefore, inherent powers exist by virtue of the tribunal's own duty to fulfill its functions. Now, the second uh, rebuttal I wish to address is this concern as to bribery, in which we have not contended that claimant in fact expressly authorized the bribe. That, that's very clear from the record that it did. What we say is principal is liable for even the implied authorization given now to draw a very simple analogy, and I end with this, if you open a cage and close your eyes and the tiger runs out, you can later turn around and say, I didn't know there was a tiger in there. You take responsibility for the acts of your agent. Claimant made no efforts, although it was legally obliged to have monitoring measures, due diligence measures over the activity of its agent. It made no efforts to do so, and in such a case, it cannot now shirk the payment made by the driver, uh, broker uh, from its own responsibility. Uh, let me address the waiver issue. The uh, claimant said that you have actually waived the right to challenge me. The 15 days a time limit actually passed. Uh, where do you find the justifiable, uh, you know, rights to challenge, to reserve your right to challenge me? In the rules or in law? Mr. Uptrader, I, I source the, the right to reserve a right uh, from very generally accepted practice. For this, I may cite the landmark case before the French courts, uh, Society Technimon versus GNP Alex. Now, here what happened was the party actually reserved its right to continue with the process, to challenge the arbitrator before the court after the ICC had struck down the challenge. But it reserved its right to do so while continuing in the arbitral process. Now, even that sort of reservation of right was upheld. The answer to your question then simply being that as long as a reservation is specific and it is timely in itself, which our reservation clearly was, it is perfectly acceptable. And here it was done in the interest of time and cost. Okay. If you're concerned about, excuse me, if you're concerned about time, uh, wouldn't it be more disruptive to challenge later in the process? opposed to earlier. Isn't that the rationale uh, behind this CTAC rule? Uh, indeed, Madam Operator. In fact, that is why we've decided to try and resolve the whole matter by simply excluding the single problem, Dr. Mercado. Now, I do not have instructions as to whether we will exercise the right that we have reserved. That is a matter to be decided at a later stage. But what is of relevance now is that my client has taken the most cost-efficient and time-efficient measure before the tribunal. Members of the tribunal, the respondent has sought to argue that the basis of the inherent power stems from the tribunal's duty to treat the parties fairly and equally. How is it fair to deprive the claimant of its right to counsel? Secondly, counsel for the respondent has said that the claimant has to take responsibility for the broker and ensure that the broker does not commit bribery. However, there is no way that the claimant can preempt all forms of illegality that, is, that a broker might engage in. Was the claimant supposed to tell its broker, you're not allowed to kill, you're not allowed to steal, you're not allowed to do anything? This is clearly not reasonable to impose such a heavy burden on a party. Thank you. Was any question asked at the time that 
that uh, this additional amount of money was uh, required? Professor Harpole, under those circumstances, it was understood between the claimant and the broker that the extra success fee was in order to reward the broker for its extra efforts in negotiating the contract. And this is also evident from the fact that the success fee was paid after the lease contract was signed and not before. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the useful submissions. Uh, in the interest of time, we have to move on to the merits of the case. I will remain sitting here just to make sure that uh, we can continue. It doesn't mean, well, it doesn't indicate victory or defeat on either side. So we will proceed with claimant on the turrets. Delivery. 
and is supported by Scott, uh, Professor Spectrum, Professor Schrenzer, in their commentary on the CISG. In the case of metallic sodium, this was a CISG case decided by the Russian Arbitration Tribunal. The facts of the case are very similar to the ones at hand. In that case itself, the seller could not perform its obligations to the buyer because his own manufacturer had suffered an emergency stoppage production. However, in the, even in that case, the tribunal held that an emergency stoppage production does not constitute an impediment beyond control and does not release the seller of his obligations. So similarly, the respondent and special devices cannot rely on late delivery as an impediment beyond control. Well, in this case, what was the impediment? Sorry, according to you. The impediment you are referring to. What was the impediment? Uh, Professor Yu, as I, as I identified just now, the impediment to the respondent is the late delivery of the semi-configurable processing units, and the impediment to two special devices is the late delivery of the D28 chips. And I do understand that there is an exception to this general principle, which the respondent will rely on, which is the sole supplier exemption. The respondent may argue that what the claiming contractor for was for a specific good which was only available from a monopolist, being high performance, and this referred to the D28 chips. However, it is important to bear in mind that this good was never contracted for. There is no express term in the contract, it being MX1 does not refer to D28 chips being used in the construction of this master control system. Now, at the same time, the respondent also cannot argue that there is an implied term in the contract. If I could first refer you to page 5 of the record itself. At page 5 of the record, at paragraph 6, at the fourth line. Indeed, I don't understand the respondent like cite this paragraph saying that Elite sought to refurbish the yacht with the latest in cabin and uh, latest conference technologies that were superior to anything otherwise available on the market. However, first of all, this request for arbitration was written in July after the breach of contract had already surfaced and after all matters came to light. And at the same time, most importantly, in his own statement of defense at page 37, paragraph 1, respondent states clearly that he has no independent knowledge of paragraph 6, which I just referred to. As such, if the respondent had no independent knowledge that my client wanted something superior, then there cannot be any implied term at the time of contracting. All my client wanted was a master control system that could provide an uninterruptible service, and this discretion was always left to the respondent because he had the expertise in choosing the uh, appropriate chips to fulfill this contractual requirement. That my so client it was not possible for you to foresee some delays. Uh, you were not aware that the D28 chips were the latest in technology and that would be used in processing units. Were you aware of the fact? Indeed, Professor, you, you were never aware that the D28 chips were going to be used. Were you aware of the supply chain? We were only aware that the respondent would engage a subsequent third party based on procedure order 2, but we didn't, were not aware of which particular third party in particular uh, concerns. And so, sorry, Mr. Clement uh, notified of the delay as soon as, as, as the respondent was aware of the uh, delay. Indeed, my client was informed of this delay. However, I wish to remind the tribunal that under Article 18 of the CISG, silence itself does not amount to acceptance. And even though my client did not respond to this uh, delay letter that was sent from the respondent, it does not mean that he has accepted this late delivery. At the same time, Article 41, Subsection 1, also states specifically that my client retains all rights to remedy, to claim damages, even if the tribunal does find this letter from the respondent to be an express request under Article 48, Subsection 2. And therefore, this condition of an impediment beyond control fails for both the respondent and special devices. Subsequently, the respondent cannot succeed under Article 79 because once again, Article 79 imposes joint conditions. If the
tribunal has no further questions, I would like to move on to my second submission dealing with damages. Indeed, the claimant understands that in order for it to succeed uh, its claim for damages, it must clear the two hurdles under Article 74, which deals with foreseeability of damages, and under Article 77, which is whether damages were reasonably incurred to mitigate my client's loss, and I'll deal with them in turn. First of all, under Article 77, to understand why my client made this uh, extra fee payment, could I first refer the tribunal to page 48 of the record itself. Did not ask for their payment. 
and that is why I wish to refer to paragraph 17 on the same page of uh, page 48, and it states clearly that what would, the question asks, what would have happened if uh, my client did not act the way it did, and it states clearly that it would have lost much more money. And Article 77 imposes an obligation on my client to mitigate its loss. This was precisely what my client was doing. It was, did you think about the fact that probably corporate executives made some refund to the conference attendees, the delegates, so that out of goodwill would pay some expression payments? Was that also considered by you when you made the expression of payments? Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you because the mic was unclear. Well, uh, were you aware of the fact, or probably the proposition that you know corporate executives made some refunds to the delegates attending the conference because you know the conference facilities were not as good as the one that was supposed to be, in. and then the corporate executives the association gave some refund to the delegates, and because of that, and also out of goodwill. You paid the ex gratia payments to the corporate executive. Thank you, Professor Yu. Uh, indeed, my client had that in mind when he made this uh, ex gratia fee payment as a preemptive settlement because, according to paragraph 19, corporate executives did effectively refund part of this fee to reduce the registration fee that its members had paid. And so, precisely the case where my client was in breach of contract was in breach with his most important client and the best way of proceeding forward was with this preemptive settlement that would have maintained all the goodwill and good relations between the two companies. And I see that my time is... So well, according to the documents I have now, uh, you paid $12,000. Is that correct? Or $120,000? We paid $120,000. $120,000. What it seems to be a number. Uh, could you shed some light on why this amount? S sorry, I can't hear you. Well, the $120,000 US dollars is an odd number. Uh, could you shed some light why this amount? Indeed. The reason why my client paid this amount is because, first of all, it was paying in relation to the, to the price that corporate executives was going to pay to my client. Now, it is not known from the record how much this contractual price is worth. However, based on paragraph 17, we, know, we do know the minimum threshold, the minimum amount that it would have cost. And this minimum amount is 670,700 US dollars, which, according to a maximum capacity of 150 people, translates to 747 US dollars uh, per person and around $100 per day, which is a reasonable amount because these members were demanding something of the highest quality and the event was going to be, uh, take place for six whole days on this yacht. And in relation to this price, therefore, it was reasonable. Okay, clear enough. Uh, <laughs> Just ask one question, um, uh, Mr. Hui. As we assess this particular part of the damages claim, um, how should we understand the nature of, of the loss that has taken place? Is this an actual loss? if we're talking about future business? <coughs> Professor Harpo, uh, indeed, this might not be an actual loss because my client has not actually lost any business. However, if my client did not act the way it did, it would have lost much more uh, losses. And Article 77 does not, does not require the claimant to show that only actual losses are recoverable because Article 77 includes any loss of profit in the future as well. How can we as a tribunal assess uh, the issue of future business that would be lost? Should we be looking at probability or, or how, how, is, how can this issue of future business be assessed as a loss? The tribunal can assess how this future business is a loss by first assessing the relationship between my client and with corporate executives the amount of contractual relations they have had in the past, how important this uh, event was to corporate executives, as well as it was to my client, and in light of all these facts, uh, assess the damages accordingly. And yes. Uh, therefore, I would just like to conclude my submissions that I would respectfully ask the
tribunal to grant my clients prayer for relief. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I ask one question? Maybe you've covered this in, in, in which I must have missed it, but how, how do you convince us that the 112,000 payment and the or amount and the 50,000 amount were reasonably foreseeable to the respondent? Thank you, Professor. Which is required, as you know, by under Article 74. Yes, indeed. Why it was reasonably foreseeable is that, in general, goods, commercial goods, are subsequently to be used for commercial purposes, and therefore, it will be clearly foreseeable that any breach by the respondent will subsequently lead to a breach on the part of my client, because my client is in the business of providing conference services, and in the case of the propane case, this was decided by the Austrian Supreme Court, this was decided precisely at the point that when commercial goods are being contracted for, it is reasonably foreseeable that such goods will subsequently be used for commercial purposes. Thank you. Professor presiding arbitrator, honorable members of the tribunal, I am Ushuta Parthaj and I am presenting the merits for Equatoriana Control Systems. My submissions for my client are two in number. First, that my client is not liable for the failure to deliver the goods on time. And second, in the event that my client is not held exempt, the damages that are being sought by the claimant are not recoverable under the CISG. I will first address the question as to exemption. However, I have noted that at the centre of this dispute is whether or not D28 chips were required by the claimant, whether or not they actually made an implied choice for these chips. And therefore, I will address this point first. Honourable Tribunal, my esteemed colleague has already pointed you to paragraph 6 of the application for arbitration. If, however, I may request you to turn back to paragraph 6, and I quote, Elite sought to refurbish the yacht with the latest in cabin and conference technologies superior to anything else otherwise available on the market. This statement, Honorable Tribunal, is very crucial. Because when interpreting a contract, not only do we look at the express stipulations in the contract, but Article 8, Sub-Article 3 of the CISG requires us to look at the surrounding negotiations that led to that contract. And this statement is evidence of that negotiation. As on the contract date, when claimant sought the latest in conference technology, and since D28 chips, by their own admission, were to be the super chip with no rival, in fact, they did make a tacit and implied choice for these very D28 chips. Madam Arbitrator, I sense some concern. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bardwaj. Um, it's interesting that you are characterizing this as a choice of claimant, uh, particularly as there, as there is no express term regarding the components. Uh, wasn't this the area of expertise of your client? Did they choose the particular components and technology? Indeed, Mr. Ar Ma Madam Arbitrator, I apologize. While my client is the expert for master control systems, my client is also a company that works only to satisfy its customers. And therefore, when the claimant told us that they wanted the latest in technology, and this latest, Madam Arbitrator, is not as on the date of contract, but as on the date of delivery of the master control system, which is much after the D28 chips went into production. So therefore, if my client had used any chips but the D28 chips when the master control system was actually delivered, the goods would have been non-conforming. And therefore, before this very arbitral tribunal, they would have been suing us or bringing us to court for non-conforming performance. Therefore, my client used these D28 chips. And in fact, from claimant's exhibit, it is quite clear that the processing units and the master control system did everything that they had hoped for. Clearly, 
if I may uh, point the arbitral tribunal to this letter. This is claimant exhibit number 4 and it's page 12 of the record and the statement is we are very pleased with the master control system that you have installed on the MSBIS. It does everything that we had hoped for. Honorable Tribunal, after making such a statement and after admitting such a statement as their own exhibit, I do not see it open to the claimant to now question our choice of T28 chips. Granted that it appears that there was uh, pleasure with the meeting of specifications, but it appears that timing was also an important as an element in the contract. Indeed, Madam Arbitrator. However, I point this arbitral tribunal to now paragraph 9 of the record. And by their own admission, if I may quote, at 26th May 2010, the chip was not yet in production, but was scheduled to begin in the middle of August 2010, i.e. in good time for the refurbishment. Clearly, Madam Arbitrator, the chips were to be available before the refurbishment was complete. And if any chip inferior to D28 had been used, we would not be providing the latest in technology. Then we would not be performing. At the time of the contract was signed, the, chip were not, the chips were not in production yet. But did you at that time you see any risks from delays? Mr. Arbitrator, I do agree that as with any novel technology, there are risks. And there were similar risks with respect to this D28 chip. However, when a customer comes to us with specific requests for the latest technology, we believe that they also acquire as well as accept this risk. And therefore, the risk for D28 chips, because it was a novel technology demanded by the client, lies upon the claimant. Well, the claimant just mentioned that they were not aware that the D28 chips were going to be used in processing units and you acquired the latest technology, the 28 chips. At that time when the chips would not be able to be shipped to, uh, you know, for the installation of the processing units, did you try to find some other alternatives which were, you know, chips at the same level as D28? Indeed, Mr. Arbitrator, in order to answer this question satisfactorily, I must point the Honorable Tribunal to question number 12, of the procedural order 2, this is on page 47. <coughs> Honorable Tribunal, if the clarification has been found, clarification 12 on page 47. <coughs> it's clearly stated in this clarification that redesign around a substitute chip with a different specification would have involved severe delay and costs while providing no guarantee of comparable performance with the unique qualities of T28. Honorable Tribunal, it is clear, if we had tried to redesign the processing units or even to use another chip, not only would there have been excessive costs, and excessive delay, but the master control system would have been non-conforming, would have been inferior to what the claimant wanted. Therefore, it would have not been reasonable for my client to redesign the master control system at all, and therefore we did not undertake this step. Honorable Tribunal, if I have addressed the question as to why D28 chips were required in this contract, I now turn to my exemption requirement under Article 79. Honorable Tribunal, as has been mentioned by my colleague, the burden of proof to show the exemption is upon me. And therefore, I will show that not only my client control systems, but also specialty devices is exempt under Article 79.1. And I turn for this first to the question of beyond the sphere of control. Now my colleague 
informed this tribunal of something known as the general procurement risk. And I agree that this concept is quite settled and is accepted. However, the reference to the general procurement risk was Professor Schlechtry, as used by my colleague. However, let me clarify. Professor Schlechtry himself recognizes that while there is a general procurement risk for generic goods, the same does not apply for special goods. Let me go. Tell me please, what is the impediment that you rely on here? Mr. Arbitrator, for my client, the impediment was specialty devices delay in performance. However... So the fire in the factory has no role to play here? Mr. Sure. Arbitrator, I would like this tribunal to imagine a set of domino pieces. The first domino piece is the fire accident. The second domino piece is the challenge device's failure. And that is what led to our delay. So while the fire accident we cannot claim was the direct impediment, the impediment does relate back to the fire accident which made these 28 chips unavailable. So isn't the question ultimately then if uh, the fire in your own factory is an impediment beyond the control of that point? Mr. Arbitrator, I could not clear. So isn't the ultimate question then if a fire in your own factory is an impediment beyond the control of that particular body? Mr. Arbitrator, I must mention that the fire accident was in the factory of high performance and my client, Control Systems, has no contractual relationship with high performance. Therefore, my client, Control System, was not in a position to either prevent or overcome the consequences of the fire accident. And therefore, if in fact the fire accident had been in our factory, and if the fire accident had been negligent rather than accidental, I would have accepted complete responsibility. However, in this situation, Honorable Tribunal, my client had no control over whether or not the fire accident occurred. Tell me, tell me what is the position of high performance under Article 79.2 of the CSG? Indeed, Mr. Arbitrator, Article 79.2 talks of a third person appointed by the party in breach to perform the whole of the contract. Now it is clear that the party in breach, or rather party with delayed performance in this case, is my client, Control Systems. However, the record is clear that my client had no contract with high performance, which means that her high performance cannot be a party appointed by my client, Control Systems. Therefore, Article 79.2 does not extend to high performance, but only extends to specialty devices who was appointed by my client. Therefore, Mr. Arbitrator, to clarify as a final point, high performance is not a third person for the purpose of Article 79.2. Mr. Arbitrator and Honorable Tribunal, I note that I am slightly short on time. Shall I turn to damages or shall I continue? Just very briefly, okay. I will just summarize on exemption then and yeah. turn to damages. On our tribunal, as to unforeseeability, a fire accident is the textbook example for a force majeure event. And a force majeure event is of such nature that in common law, even where there is strict liability, a force majeure event is an exception. And the reason is that a force majeure event by its very definition, is extraordinary and beyond any party's control. Therefore, when such a fire accident prevented performance, even if indirectly, such an event cannot be held to be foreseeable, and my client ought to be exempt under the Article 79 standard. Honorable Tribunal, with this, I merely touch upon the point of insuperability after the fire accident, within three working days, high performance had already allocated and delivered the chips to Atlantis Technical Solutions. Therefore, the only reasonable thing that my client could do 
was approach technical solutions for these chips. And we did do this. Not only that, we offered them a higher price for these T28 chips. But our offer was refused. Therefore, my client undertook the reasonable measures to try and overcome the impediment, the debilitating impediment that it faced, but was unsuccessful. And therefore, the requirement is fulfilled for Article 79. Madam Arbitrator, what is required is that the impediment be insuperable. <coughs> that is, that the party could not overcome it. And since we took reasonable measures, and in fact, I believe we went out of our way since we contacted a party with whom we had no contractual history or relationship and offered a higher price. This is not only reasonable, but the appropriate measure to try and overcome the impediment. And since this measure failed, the impediment should be seen as insuperable. Honorable Tribunal, I now turn to the submission as to damages. Since my colleague has addressed the arbitral tribunal only on the point of the ex gratia amount, I will also limit my argument to this head of loss. Honorable Tribunal, to begin with, let me state that it is quite easy and it is quite easy to be generous when the expense is on another party. And this is what the claimant has done. They go ahead and they make a payment to corporate executives, an ex gratia payment that corporate executives never demanded because they speculated the fact that they might lose corporate executives' business. How does the speculative belief of the claimant rise to the level required to make loss of goodwill compensable? Honorable Tribunal, there is a series of cases, whether it is the art books case, whether it is the bulletproof vests case from Greece, it is quite clear that loss of goodwill is only compensable when there is an actual and monetary loss that the party has faced. However, in our case, not only is there no evidence of monetary loss, there is no threat of any loss of business. Therefore, on what basis is the speculation being, being upheld? Honorable Tribunal, since claimant has not shown any evidence that the business would be lost or that corporate executives had made any threat that they would take away the business, there is no reasonableness attached to this ex gratia payment. And as a final point on ex gratia... Excuse me, Ms. Barton, why should we yes. just go back to that point? Are you suggesting then that goodwill is uh, an element that does not have monetary value? Honorable Tribunal, the advisory opinion 6, with respect to the CISG Advisory Council, they have quite clearly held that since a businessman only cares about the monetary value or the turnover of his business. When loss of goodwill does not have a monetary value attached to it, which it, it inherently does not, it cannot be paid. So if a client or if a claimant is claiming loss of goodwill, it must demonstrate what loss of turnover or what loss of future business it apprehends. The problem with this dispute is that there is no apprehension of such loss of goodwill. In fact, if we show Respondent Exhibit 1, it states that the conference was successful and that corporate executives thought MS Pacifica Star was an appropriate substitute for the MS Fis. I'm sorry, I think I have to interfere because, you know, we're running out of time. And I hope the uh, claimant to give just uh, some rebuttal. Thank you, Professor Yu. Members of the tribunal, the seller's obligations are twofold. One, timely delivery, and two, uh, master control system that complies with Annex 1. And what the respondent has done is to compromise one of his own obligations against the other at the expense of my client. Therefore, it must be held liable. Thank you. Honorable Tribunal, it is true that we thought that it was more important to provide a conforming good than to provide
provide a defective wood on the correct contract date. If we had provided the master control system that was not appropriate for the MSS, the claimant would have lost more money with respect to the corporate executive's conference and would have been sued by them for non-performance. Therefore, my client did what a reasonable and commercially prudent company would do. More submissions? No? Well, that's very good. We're just on time. Well, uh, I think both teams did excellent, uh, excellent job. Congratulations to you. It's going to be a very hard decision for us. Either one, you know, no matter which team wins, it's going to be very hard on us, not on you. Actually, we didn't. We were not so hard on you. And uh, we know that I've spent uh, months to prepare for this. It's not easy for you to, you know, survive up to the end of this competition. So, congratulations to the teams, and also congratulations to all the students and coaches and the organizers of this event. So, on behalf of CTAC, I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all of you. And uh, with that, I bring this hearing to a conclusion. And I have to apologize to you for not being able to stay on and celebrate the, the last big event with you because I have to leave right away and, uh, because my mother has been hospitalized and to travel back to Beijing immediately. So I wish you good luck and uh, before I go, before we make any deliberation as to who is going to win, I wish that every one of you will be concerned about step arbitration. And the other day when I traveled on plane, I saw a commercial which said, uh, mishaps could take in three. One, you're broke, two, you're dumped by your girlfriend, and third, in case you run into a commercial commercial dispute, you have not agreed on CTAC arbitration. <laughs> Thank you again.